Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. I love that video of how symbolically it shows the weights that many of us carry around whether they are self-imposed weights that we put up upon ourselves, weights that someone else put upon us against our own will, or decisions that we make every day, we need freedom from that. We need freedom from the weights that hold us down and hold us back from pursuing the greatness, which is the life that God gave us. One of the weights, so we're going to talk about today, one of the weights that we carry around that slow us down from fulfilling what God has designed for us is the word offense. Offense. Offense is a heavy, heavy weight. There's no real cure to offense. You either take offense or you let it go. There's no cure besides that. You're in control of it. And that's the thing about offense, right? Offense doesn't come, offense is taken. I take offense to that. If you don't take offense, you can't be offended. Before we begin today, I want to share a story with you about Muhammad Ali. Anybody know Muhammad Ali? Muhammad Ali was on an airplane one time flying commercial early in his career. Don't really know where he was going, but a stewardess noticed that he did not have his seatbelt buckled. The world-famous boxer who said he was invincible. For, for, I uh, was flying a few weeks ago and this lady in front of me didn't have her seatbelt buckled. You could see it hanging down in the aisle and the stewardess had to ask her four times to buckle her seatbelt so we could take off. And I gotta be honest with you, I want to smack her in the back of the head. <laughs> I did. I mean, she was just right in front of me. I want to smack her back. Bow! Put the seatbelt on. How many times has this lady got to ask you, right? Anyway, the stewardess looked at him and said, Mr. Ali, please fasten your seatbelt. And he looked back at her, he smiled, he said, Superman don't need no (laughs) seatbelt. To which the stewardess looked back to him and said, Superman don't need no airplane. (laughs) Fasten your seatbelt. I love that. How easy is it to take offense when someone is simply doing their job? It is the stewardess's job to ensure that you have your seatbelt fastened. Well, I don't like that. We take offense, we're upset. We can get offended about anything. Listen, one time, someone got offended because I sat down at the dinner table, they made a meal, I tasted it, and I said, oh, could I have some salt and pepper, please? What, my food's not seasoned enough? (laughs) Lack a little bit of salt, please. I didn't say it was bland, I didn't say it was nasty, but can a brother get some salt on his mashed potatoes? (laughs) Offense. It's so easy to be offended. And I want to share a story with you from the Bible today. It's a story of Jesus, where there's an individual who has an opportunity to take offense. And I will tell you, what is said and what is done is offensive. It is offensive, but this person does not choose to take offense, and because of it, I want to show you the blessing that incurs, okay? Matthew 15, 21, Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and it says this, then Jesus went from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, the woman from Cana came through the region and cried out, saying to him, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon-possessed. But he answered her not a word. Yo, Jesus sure ignored her. Pretend like she didn't exist. He answered not a word. And his disciples came to him and they urged him and said, send her away. She cries out after her. She's annoying us. But he answered and said, I was not sent. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him and said, Lord, help me. But he answered and said to her, 
it is not good that you take the children's bread and throw it to little dogs. Guys, do you realize what he just said to her? He just called her a female dog. We got a word for that in English, but I'm not allowed to say it live on the internet. I'll get bleeped. Jesus calls her that straight out. Is that not what he says? It is not good that I take the children's bread and give it to the dogs. That's crazy. She comes back again a third time. She comes back like she's not getting a hint. Like, get away from me, woman. And he said, yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus said to her, whoa. Whoa. Great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. Confusing story. Confusing story because I think to myself, man, Jesus was all loving, all caring. He went into these places. He wants everybody healed and delivered and set free. We need to break this down. All right? So you ready to do a study? Deep dive study. Okay. Let's look at verse 21. Then Jesus went from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. Tyre and Sidon were the regions where the um, Cyrene Phoenician Gentiles lived. These Gentiles did not have a covenant with God. They did not have rights to the things of God. you got to remember, in this time, only God's blessings were available to God's people. That's why what Paul did later on in the New Testament was so groundbreaking. He was like, yeah, I came to preach deliverance to the Gentile. That was not the case at this moment. Jews were the only one who had a connection to God or had a covenant with God. Jesus went, though, to a place, to a people who did not have a covenant with God. Jesus went to a place and to a people who did not have a covenant with God. And this is not the only time that he did it. There's another story in the Bible where Jesus says to disciples, we must needs go through Samaria. And he encounters a Samaritan woman at a well. Would not have associated with them. Did not need to be there. He could have gone around like everyone else. What I want you to understand is that Jesus is in a place reaching a people that no one else wanted to reach and no one else could reach. But it's still confusing why the situation went down as it did. We need to build this out. Verse 22, and behold, a woman of Canaan came to, the Lord, to, to him from the region and cried out saying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely demon possessed. The woman came from this region, she was a Gentile, she had no covenant with God, she had no promises of God, but she didn't wait for a promise, she went to the promise. She didn't wait for a promise, she went to the promise. You see, Jews and Canaanite Gentiles did not commingle They were considered unclean to the Jews. But this lady heard about Jesus. She heard about Jesus. She heard about this miracle-working Messiah that she had no right to access. But she said, I'm in need. I'm going after him anyway. Mark 7, 25, same story for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. She heard about him. How does faith come? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So she must have heard that he was a deliverer. She must have heard that he cast out demons from somebody else because she believed that he could help her. I got to tell you this. It matters what you hear about Jesus. It matters what you hear about God. If you are raised in a home or in a church that tells you that God is an angry God and he's going to punish you every time you mess up, then every time you mess up, you're going to run from him. You're not going to go to him. Can I give you an example? Let's just say you raise your kids to say, I brought you into this world. I take you out of this world. You raise your kids saying, you ever get in trouble? I'm going to leave you in jail. You raise your kids like that, guess what? When they're in trouble, guess who the last person is they're going to call? You. 
They ain't going to call you. They're not going to get pulled over and, and have a situation and say, I got one phone call, I'm calling dad. No way. They're like, I'd rather sit in jail to see my dad. <laughs> my dad's going to beat me. He's going to punch me in the face. And then, and then dads, we get all upset. Why didn't you call me? I would have helped you. Well, you told me my whole life you killed me. <laughs> right? It matters what you hear. It matters what your family members hear about your faith. Do, do people know why you got out of bed on a Sunday morning when you could have been sitting next to the pool, sipping coffee in bed? Why you came out to the house of God? Do people know? It matters what people hear about your faith. It matters. Because what you hear determines what you do with it. What you hear determines what you do. So I want to read you this passage in John 10, 10. It says this, for the thief cometh not except to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come, Jesus has come, that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So I want to show you this. There are two people, there are two things that are either coming after you or coming for you. The devil's coming after you. Scare you? Don't be scared. The thief comes. He's coming after you to steal, kill, and destroy. So I'm going to give you a really elementary Bible lesson. Say this with me. God is good. The devil is bad. Okay. Here's a statement that pisses me off, and I can't even say it nicer than that. I can't even say it nicer than that. When people come into my office and they say, Pastor, I need to talk to you. All these bad things are happening in my life, and I know that God must have a purpose in it for me. God is good. The devil is every good and perfect gift comes from above. But the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So if crap is happening to you, it's not God. It's not God. It's an attack of the enemy. There's evil. Dude, like, we don't understand there's evil. We watch movies that got evil. You know killers are evil, right? Watch Criminal Minds. It's evil. <laughs> Something bad's happening. It's the enemy. It's the devil. Now, we do understand because we're really smart people that God can use what the enemy has meant for evil for his glory and his honor, right? God can use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. But God is not trying to teach you a lesson by doing bad things in your life. I mean, just think how asinine that is, how unloving that is. I am going to take my nine-year-old son's hand, and I'm going to put it in a frying pan to teach him. <laughs> Pans are hot. <laughs> Don't touch it. We know that that's abuse. We know that that's child abuse. How could we ever think Elohim God, Jehovah God, Creator God would do that to us? That's abuse. It matters what you hear about God. All right. So there are people who question miracles today. They question whether healing is for today, whether signs and wonders are for today, whether tongues are for today, because there is one passage in the Bible. It does say, where there's tongues, it shall cease. Where there's healings, it shall cease. Where there's working of miracles, it shall cease. The Bible does say it. But can we think logically? Duh. Do you need healing when you're dead? You're dead. There ain't no more healing. You're in heaven. When the trumpet sounds and Jesus returns for his church and we all go to heaven, we don't need to speak in tongues because we are going to speak the heavenly language. We don't need to be healed because we have our eternal bodies. So duh, yes, there will be a day when all those things cease. But until then, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and it is growing and operating and working in our lives. Amen? All right. Here's the question, though, and, and here's, I, I do want you to 
I, I do want you to kind of have a serious moment when I ask this question. This mom is coming because her daughter's demon possessed. How did that demon get into that woman's home? Parents, moms and dads, adults, we need to be careful what we let in our homes. We need to be careful what we let in our homes. We need to be careful what we let on our internet devices. We need to be careful what we watch on our TVs. We're bringing these things into our homes. Now, we say, no, it's just, you know, it's not really big, just, you know, it's just little stuff, nothing major. Okay, so no, no problem. Let's just talk about this. You've got a three-year-old, a five-year-old, and a seven-year-old, okay? And I'm going to invite a sex offender to come over to your house with me for dinner. Just for a few minutes. Just for a few minutes. And I'm going to let them go put your kids to bed. <laughs> By themselves. In their bedroom. Oh, that makes sense. We're going to kill somebody. Right? I'm going to hurt somebody. You try to talk to my kids, I'm going to hurt you. But we're not protecting our kids in their bedrooms by themselves on their devices. What, how did this thing get in the home? How did this thing get here? I'm not be accusing. I'm not, I'm not judging. I'm not making anybody feel bad. I'm just saying I think we need to just stop being in autom automatic mode and thinking about protecting our families and protecting our souls, protecting our eyes, protecting our ears. What are we allowing into our homes? This isn't judgment. And if you feel a little awkward today, hey, man, I'm with you in this struggle. I'm with you in this, man. Like, all three of my kids got devices and things. But there's ways to block stuff. And All right. You get what I'm saying? Verse 22 says, she cries out for mercy. She cries out for mercy. She wants this help. But why does Jesus ignore her? This bothers me. Because this isn't the character of Jesus. Why is he ignoring her? It took me a long time. And this is my opinion, okay? I'm, I'm going to tell you, I do not have theological fact about this. I tried to find theological fact, but there is none. This is just my opinion. Ready? My opinion why Jesus ignored her and Jesus responded to her in the way that he did originally is because of her approach. She's saying, son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David is a term that she would have heard Jews call him. Son of David meant the line of David meant the Messiah. She's calling him by a name that's not a name for her. She's calling him by a name that someone else would call him. She's not calling him out of a heart of need and relationship. She's calling him what everyone else is calling him. Let me ask this question like, well, let me tell you this. There was this guy one time. He thought we were like friends. And so one day we're hanging out with her. And he goes, yo, Mikey, come over here. Mikey? <laughs> Who's Mikey? <laughs> Who's Mikey? Ain't nobody ever called, my daddy ain't never called me Mikey. My mommy ain't never called me Mikey, right? N Mikey ain't my nickname. And I don't know you like that for you to try to give me a nickname, Mikey. <laughs> uh, you will call me Reverend Michael Joseph. <laughs> the longest name I can think of, Mikey. We don't have the relationship for you to make up nicknames. You ain't call me Pooh Bear. <laughs> I don't know you like that. Call me Pooh Bear, right? And it's like she's trying to use this insider name for someone she doesn't have a relationship with. I heard people call you Son of David. Son of David, have mercy on me. I, I don't know you. I don't owe you nothing. So, fun fact if she's watching, oh my gosh, I'm in so much trouble. But my mom. My mom's name, everyone called my mom Lynn McKelvey. That was her name, Lynn McKelvey, right? But that's not my mom's real name. My mom's legal name is Terry Lynn McKelvey. So one time we're at the store and she left her credit card at the counter. And there's this lady and we're saying, Terry, Terry. But we just walk in, completely don't even know that it's my mom. 
Because ain't nobody know that my mom's name is Terry. Even my mom. My mom forgot her name's Terry. <laughs> so it's not so much like she was trying to facetiously like ignore the lady. She's just like, if she said Lynn, I would have turned around, right? Same kind of moment here. Son of David, and Jesus is like, I don't recognize that voice. I don't recognize faith. See, I believe Jesus is trying to draw her faith out. I believe that Jesus is trying to draw her to a place that she will call upon him from her heart, not from her head. That she will call upon him based upon her need and her desire to have a relationship with him, not simply by his popular name. But he answers her, not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. When she gets no response from Jesus, she kind of moves over to the disciples and begs them. She's persistent. Persistency is a major feature of faith. Persistency is a major feature of faith. But here's the truth. I don't really believe that Jesus is ever looking to send someone away from him. He's looking for people to come to him, but he wants people to come to him with the right heart. His desire is to bring her to a right place of thinking so she can step into the right place of believing. I don't think that he was being as rude as it sounds. I believe that he's working her through a process. Matthew 15, 24. But he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And this is a true statement. This is Jesus' first assignment. His first assignment is to his Jewish people. But his assignment later would expand to reach the entire Gentile world after the cross. So he's not necessarily speaking incorrectly. He's just kind of speaking under law. He's speaking under current circumstances. Matthew 15, 25, then she came and worshiped him and said, Lord, help me. Now that sounds like relationship. The greatest prayer you could ever pray, the most faith that you could ever put into prayer is one word, help. Anything after that is you just adding words to try to convince yourself and God to do what you're asking him. Help. I'm at my end. I can't figure this out. Help. Help. She says, Lord, help me. She comes back that second time and she approaches him without rehearsed words or borrowed words. She's not coming, speaking like someone else told her, read this script. She's now speaking out of her own heart. She cuts through all the extra fluff and says, Lord, help me. It annoys me when I hear people like try to use a bunch of religious words in prayer that they have no idea what they're saying. Heavenly Father, we beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, and we pr I'm like, do you know what beseech is? <laughs> I love when I hear people pray like, Dad, I'm feeling some sort of way right now. I need your help. I need your help. Relationship. Speaking with your own language. A true heart. The Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. These words that she says, Lord, help me, expresses her heart. Then Jesus goes on in Matthew 15, 26, but he answered, he said, it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. Offensive. She could take offense right here. She should be offended. I'm offended for her. Look at the Amplified says, and he answered her, it is not right, proper, becoming, or fair to take the children's bread and throw it to dogs. We got to understand the time. It was a staple at every meal and at every table setting to have bread. It was like the main feature, the unleavened bread. And what Jesus is kind of putting here to say is that healing 
and deliverance belongs to God's children. Healing and deliverance is a staple of the Christian life, of the covenant people's life. Healing and deliverance should be something that is accessible to all of us. But what was the great faith? What was this great faith? I want you to understand this. I'm, I'm, I'm jumping ahead, and I didn't explain this yet. Has anybody ever been to another country, and you see, like, adult dogs just, like, running the streets wild? All over the streets, and, right? You've seen that before? That, that's kind of how it was in this time. Adult dogs were not cared for. They had no master. But puppies were cared for. Puppies were in the home, and they'd be fed. And they'd be cared for, and they'd be nurtured. But once they got older, it was kind of like, get out of the house, and they were just out the street. I have, a, I have a new puppy. We just got a boxer puppy. She's like this big. She's so cute. She has my heart. I want to feed her table scraps so bad, but I don't, you know. So she's identifying herself as saying, but I'm just a puppy. And puppies have masters. And I'm submitting myself to your mastership. I don't know it all. I don't have the answers. I know I don't have the covenant rights, but please don't treat me like an adult dog who should know better. Don't leave me on the street fatherless. Puppies get the scraps from the master's table. She didn't argue. She didn't get offended. She didn't walk away and huff and puff. She's refusing to give up on her daughter's deliverance. She says, but even the puppies get the scraps from the master's table. And here's my revelation. Here's what I believe was happening. And again, I can't prove this. This is just what I feel God said to me, maybe for our house. Why did he say that that statement was such great faith? In the book of Psalm, David says, you prepare the table for me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table for me. Well, if God prepared a table, there's definitely going to be bread at that table. But there's going to be all sorts of blessings that God has prepared at the table of his children. And here's what I believe she was saying. When she said, even the little dogs get to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table, what she was saying was this. At least let me have the blessings that your people are taking for granted. Could it be that even that's today, like as Christians, we have all the blessings of God at our disposal, but we don't use them? We have all the blessings of God available to us, but we don't use them. We have the Bible on every single device, but we don't read it. And she says, I'll take what your people take for granted. I'll take the blessings that they don't receive. And here's my heart today with no judgment. And I knew I wanted to speak to our online audience a little bit. But I want to ask kind of like, what happened to you? What happened to you, the one who used to be a leader in your local church? What happened to you, the one who believed they once had a calling, who was a teacher? Where's your lesson today? Where's the blessing today? Where's the anointing today that God put on you? Are you leaving it on the table, uneaten? Unused. I was raised in a home. The reason why I'm kind of a little overweight. I was raised in a home that you will eat everything on your plate. And I used to get upset. I was like, I didn't serve myself. I didn't put that much food on my plate. But then we had to eat it all, right? And then the reason, if you don't eat everything on your plate, there's kids starving in other countries. And then I was like all annoyed. Like, well, then ship it to them. <laughs> but I wonder today in our society if we've become picky eater Christians. And we're like pushing the peas off the plate. We're pushing the broccoli off the plate. We're pushing the Caesar salad off the plate because that's not tasty. That's not fun. I don't want to eat that. And there's all this leftover blessings of God that we're not consuming. And there's a world dying and going to hell. And 
We've got all the blessings sitting on our table uneaten. The one who used to be a leader, the one who used to be a teacher, the one who used to be outgoing in their faith and sharing the gospel and no longer are, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. God will fill that seat at the table. The seat that was supposed to be yours, the seat that should be yours, now someone else sits in. Because the great faith that says, if no one else wants to eat it, I'll eat it. Because there are people who are starving for the gospel that will eat your peas yeah. <laughs> and the broccoli and the salad. This is what she's saying. I'll just eat the crumbs. Because here's her revelation. She's saying a crumb of God's power is enough to fix her situation. A crumb of God's power is enough to fix my situation. I don't need a piece of the pie. Just let me lick the spoon. Just let me touch the anointing. Let me have a piece, a crumb that your people don't want. Guys, we're in a generation like that right now. We're in a generation like that right now. I I'm just going to talk this like, hear my heart. I'm trying to inspire and coach. I'm not trying to put down. But even long-term Christians don't want church right now. That's scary. That's scary. What's the Lord going to return for? A church half empty? He says he's going to return for a church without spot or wrinkle. But how full is it? And why? And then, and then we're going to talk about evangelizing? We're going to evangelize with people who don't even want it for themselves. This is, the, this is what I believe the story is. She said, I'll take the scraps that no one else is eating. She had great faith. Jesus says, oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be done unto you as you desire. And in that hour, her daughter was made whole. She had great faith. You see, great faith will not attempt to protect its pride. Ooh. Great faith will not attempt to protect it because great faith is not easily offended. Great faith is not easily offended. And I'm going to say a very bold statement. I think one of the greatest enemies of faith is offense. I don't think that you can grab a hold of faith and hold on to offense at the same time. I don't think you do it. I think if you need to step into great faith, you have to let go of offense. Matthew 11, 6 says this, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Blessed is he. If you want to be blessed, you can't be offended. If you want to be blessed, don't take offense. Well, Pastor Mike, there are so many things that are offensive. Sure there are, but you don't have to take the offense. You are in control of that. My daughter the other day, me and her got into an argument because she said that my statement makes her very angry. My statement is this, no one can make you angry. That statement makes her angry. <laughs> Ironic. I said, honey, no one can make you angry. You choose to be angry. Yeah, but people say, people can say whatever they want. That doesn't mean that you have to be angry because of what they said. People just piss me off. No one can piss you off. No one has the power to do that. No one has the power to do that. You are in control of your emotions. You are in control. You are. So I'm a control freak, and I love the fact that I'm in control of that. <laughs> because I believed that one time I wasn't. That I had to respond in anger when someone said something that made me angry. But I don't. This woman could have been offended. She could have walked away. That stupid Jesus called me a dog. As if I'm some kind of dog and talked to me this way. She could have, and guess what? Her daughter would have died demon-possessed. She let go of offense. I'm going to put myself in a very vulnerable position. Because I believe in a kingdom urgency so bad. I believe in a returning to the things of God so bad. But I'm going to say this. As a pastor, as a person, as a friend, if I've done something that has offended you, I apologize. I repent. 
If you're watching online and you're no longer going to church because of something that was said or done, I apologize. But don't let that offense be a reason why you're not fulfilling your kingdom mandate. I can't apologize for the whole church world. I can't apologize for every pastor because some of them like the fact that you're offended. But I believe that there's more in you. There's more in you that God has a bigger plan for you than what you're settling for right now. If this lady was offended by Jesus, she would not have received her blessing. This is paramount. Because there's a lot of people in the church world who are offended by Christianity. They're offended by what God is doing, or they're offended by what pastors are doing. Or they're offended by whatever. They're offended by pastors trying to figure out how to rebuild churches in the middle of a pandemic. But here's what I ask. If there's something in your life that you've been holding on to, an offense that's holding you back, could I pray today that you could let go of that and grab a hold to faith? That we can let those things go, whatever it is in your life. Maybe there's something in your marriage that you've been holding on to against your spouse. And we're not just talking about, for, we're not just talking about forgiveness. We're talking about any kind of offense. When, when, when we step into that place, just, I'm going to let that go. That means I'm also letting go of the ability to bring it back up ever again. That's hard, isn't it? That's hard. I want to pray today for a moment, and I want to close out. Father, I pray today that there's something in our heart, something that we were holding on to, that was holding us back and it was holding someone else back. Lord, I pray that we could let that offense go. We could bury that thing. We could tear it down because we know that offense creates division. Lord, help us to be united as a body of believers, as a body of Christ pursuing you. Lord, if we've caused offense in our relationships, we lay that at your feet. Forgive us. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pursue you openly in Jesus' name. Here's my question for you today. What's your next step of faith? What's the thing that God's calling you to do? Maybe you once were a teacher. Maybe you once were a leader in a church. Maybe you've never been a leader in a church. Maybe you're brand new to church in Christianity. Maybe you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Maybe you just have and you're looking for that next step. A great next step is water baptism. Water baptism. If you've never taken your confession public and been water baptized, that's a great step next step for me you see I've been in church I've been on staff at this church for 27 years I've been in church uh, my dad founded this thing when I was three years old for so 39 years I've been in this church there's always a next step even for me I'm back in college right now I'm going after my masters of divinity through the college that we offer here because there's a next step a next step for every single one of us maybe you want to be a leader and you're looking hey what Maybe you have a master's degree. Maybe you're going to want to go for your PhD. I don't know what God is calling you to do, but I know what God's calling us. He's calling us to start pushing forward and advancing the kingdom at an urgent rate. I don't know why. I don't know if the end times are coming soon. I don't know what. I'm not trying to scare anybody. But I am saying this. It's time that we start doing something for God, that we start moving towards God. That's what this whole thing is right here. She said, I will take what the church doesn't want. I, listen, I'll be darned. I'll be darned if God has a blessing box that says Mike McKelvey on it that I ain't going to play with every toy in that box. I don't want anything that's not mine, but I want everything that is mine. I don't want to settle for anything less. So we got to get all the other stuff out of the way. The stumbling blocks and the offenses and the hurts and the pains. We gotta get them out of the way. We gotta get the, the weights out of our bag so that we can pursue the things of God. If you're watching online or you're in the room today, 
And my first call is this. You've never made Jesus Christ Lord of your life and you need to today. Today's the day of salvation. But for that second group, maybe today you're like, I need a rededication moment. I need a point where I said, okay, today was the day that I came back on track and I began to pursue the things of God once again. Maybe that's you today. And, and then maybe there's the third one. You're saying, Lord, I don't know what place I'm in, but would you increase my faith? Would you increase my faith so that I could believe? Maybe you're still on the fence, but you believe there's a God, you're not sure it's Christianity. You're not ready to make a decision today, but you're saying, Lord, would you increase my faith? Lord, I thank you, I praise you today, that if those that are here today hear your word but are not ready for that decision, I pray that you would increase their faith. That there would be a day that you would say, wow, such great faith. Let it be to us according to your word. We pray for that. Lord, I pray for those that are here that are ready for that moment to take that step towards you. That today would be a starting point, a starting point of faith in you. I pray, God, that we could let go of offense, those hurts, those things that have dug deep. Help us, Lord, to have our minds renewed to the life-giving gospel of Jesus Christ. Help us to live happy, joy-filled lives that you've designed for us. If you're here today, you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, or you need to recommit, pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.